Okay, so today we have a very special treat for you. At least I think she's a very special treat. So my beautiful wife, Kimberly, is going to share with us today. So Kim, come on up. Thank you. Good morning. I will never forget one of the first times I came to church here. It was the summer of 2004. And I even remember I was sitting about four rows back, right in the middle. And I had just maybe met Pastor Dave a couple of times. I really wasn't familiar with all of his antics yet at this point and what he was capable of. And he stood up here and he was preaching about how the Bible is the absolute truth, the absolute authority. And to prove his point, this is what he said, that we need to follow everything to a T because this is God's design, this is God's plan for us. And he said, if there's something in here you disagree with, you might as well just tear it out. And he did. He took the page, he ripped it out of his Bible, he crumpled it up, and he threw it on the ground. And I think the whole entire church went, <gasps> and I know it was, it was moments before I breathed again after that. I kept thinking, Pastor Dave, you're going to get in so much trouble. <laughs> and then, to make matters worse, he did it again. You don't like this page, you don't like this passage, he ripped it out, crumpled it up, and threw it on the ground. Well, he didn't get struck by lightning. He went on to finish his sermon, and I think I started breathing again. But that moment was a defining moment for me for a couple of reasons. The first reason was I knew at that point I had found my church home. Because any church with a pastor, with a leader that, that, that's that committed to the truth, to go to that extreme to prove his point, I knew I was in a safe place because our pastors, Pastor Dave and all the pastors, hold themselves accountable to this book, and they hold each other accountable to this book. And they base all of their actions and all of their plans and all of their thoughts and all of the church's plans on what this book says. So we can trust that. So that was a real defining moment for me. I knew that I had found my church home. I have never looked back and never regretted that. This is a church I've been married in and raising my family in, and I'm confident that I've made the best decision. And the second reason that was a defining moment for me was because it made me kind of wonder, were there passages of the Bible, principles of the Bible, that maybe I was doing that to? Not literally tearing out, but symbolically getting rid of because I didn't like them because they didn't fit my image of what I thought God should be. And I was pretty sure that I was doing that. We're starting a series today called Defining Moments. And in the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at these, these challenging passages the, that we come face to face with, head to head, where we have to make a decision. And that decision could be life-changing, could be mind-altering could be future changing. They're the game changing moments. And we're gonna explore some of these in the next few weeks. And the way I see it is when we get to these moments, these defining moments, we have three paths we can take. The first one, we can reject it. Just tear that page out of your Bible. The second one, we can ignore it and hope that maybe we're not accountable. And the third path, we can accept it and embrace it. I want to explore these paths a little bit more. Path one, reject it. This is not for me. Tear it out of your Bible. Well, here's the problem with that path. God has designed this. He's put the lines where he wanted them for our benefit, for our own good, for our own safety, for our own security, and the good of the church, the good of the world. He has drawn those lines. And when we start moving the lines, because we don't quite like what this book says, everything gets really muddy, and we lose those parameters. And, and sometimes we can get so far away from the original path that we can't even see it anymore. And we take ourselves out of that umbrella of God's protection and God's grace and God's covering. So rejecting it is not a safe choice. It's a slippery slope. What about path two? We can ignore it hope that we're not accountable. Well, here's the problem with that. I can also ignore the speed limit, like on Main Street where that police car sits by the cemetery every Sunday morning. 
I can ignore that, but am I any less accountable? I'm still going to be accountable. What happens when we have conflicts in relationships or in our jobs or with our health or with our finances? When we ignore things that challenge us, they don't go away. And when they resurface, usually they have a tendency to be a little worse than they were to begin with. So we're on another slippery slope with path two. Path three, accepting and embracing the difficult, challenging passages. This might be the hardest one, but it's the only safe one. And we're going to be looking at an example of that today. You know, we approach scripture from many different influences. Our, our upbringing, the church we grew up in, our parents' beliefs, um, our friends maybe, modern society for sure is a big influence, even politics, these are all things that influence the way we come at scripture and our view of God. And I know myself and maybe many of you have said or heard somebody say at some point, uh, I just can't believe that about God. No, that's not my God. I don't think God really meant that. I think he was just talking to Bible people. I know he wasn't talking to me. I know I've said that and I've certainly thought it in the past. <clears throat> so what we do is we conform God to the image we want instead of to the true God that's in the Bible. When Jesus came to the earth... God was very mysterious to people. They didn't really understand him. They didn't understand that they could have that relationship with the Father. And Jesus came to bridge that gap. Before that, they had the law, and they knew that. And that's what they used, because that's what they had. But they didn't understand they could have that relationship with God. And Jesus came to, to show that to people. And when he spoke, people listened to him, because he spoke with authority people understood, some people understood that to know Jesus was to know the Father. To understand Jesus was to understand the Father. But he got confronted with people on each path. Some people rejected him. Actually, many people rejected him and in fact even made fun of him. Some people ignored him, but there are some people that accepted what he said and embraced that. So we're going to look at a passage today where Jesus is talking to a group of Jews in Rome. They were under Roman rule. And these were Jews that were already believing, so they were stepping out onto path one. They were accepting what he was saying. They were already believing. And, and I want to take a look at what he said to them. It's a short passage, but it has a huge nugget of truth. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. John 8, 31 through 33. And here's what it says. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? All right, well, let's take a look at that a little bit. This is the perfect example of that cause-effect relationship that you learned about in school. If, then. If A, then B. One event causes another event. I know I've said it to my children. If you clean your room, then you will get five dollars. Or if you go to work, then you will get paid. If it doesn't rain, we'll go to the pool. If, then. And Jesus is saying, if you do this, then this. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, then the truth shall make you free. Well, I was thinking about the word abide. I don't know that I've ever actually used that in a sentence. I've heard it, maybe, you know, a, a principal at school would say, abide by the school rules, but I, I myself don't think I've used it. So I wanted to kind of see what 
what does that word exactly mean? So I looked it up, and actually there, are, there were so many words, so many synonyms for abide, so I wanted to share these with you, and some of them actually surprised me a little bit. So abide means to accept, to act in accordance with, to obey, to follow, to uphold, to adhere to, to stick to, to stand by, and these, these last two are my favorites, to remain attached to. Picture yourself remaining attached to this book. And the last one really stood out in my mind, to conform to. I thought about that, conform to. To change our thinking to match what this says. And that's not an easy thing. Now, the Jews that Jesus was talking to had a very interesting response. They responded by saying, in verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Well, it's kind of a funny answer because in fact, at that time, they were in captivity to the Romans. And then there was that little piece of 400 years where they were in captivity to Egypt. So somehow they had forgotten all that. But Jesus wasn't really talking about physical freedom. When he said, you, the truth will make you free, he wasn't talking about physical freedom. That's what they understood. But what he was talking about was spiritual freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from the law. Freedom from the enemy freedom from our messed up thinking, freedom from ourselves. That's what he was talking about. But they completely missed that, and they were focused on physical freedom. But isn't that just like us sometimes? We're so kind of out of focus that we completely miss where we are. We completely miss which path we're supposed to be on. We've gotten so far out of it. Maybe we're in denial about our own situation. Maybe we don't recognize it at all. Maybe we just tune out those voices. We don't recognize our own situation. And that's where they were. You know, not, not too long after Pastor Dave's page-tearing sermon, I had another defining moment. Chip and I were engaged at the time, and he was talking to me about the principle of tithing. And he read to me from Malachi chapter 3, where God talks about, uh, well, first of all, tithing. I didn't know what that was because it was a new word for me. I'd grown up going to church, but it was just not a word that I had heard. I certainly didn't know what it meant. So he, he shared with me from Malachi chapter 3, where God says to, to test him in this, giving your top 10% of your income back to God, back to the church. And I, I read Malachi chapter 3 with Chip, and God says, test, test me in this, and you will see. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour out blessings on you if you do this. And Chip was talking to me about this, and, and I, I listened, but I said, no. Do you know how much money that is? I am not going to do that. Sorry, you can do that. I am not doing that. And I was planting my feet firmly on path one. I am rejecting this biblical principle. But the problem is, kind of agitated me. You know that voice in your head that just keeps going. And it, it, I couldn't stay there very long. I, can't, I couldn't stay in that place of rejection very long. So I tried path two, tried to ignore it. I was a teacher. I had been teaching for a long time. I consider myself a champion of ignoring many, many things. <laughs> Except Chip wouldn't let me ignore it. Imagine that. So finally, I, I had to come face to face with, with that challenging passage for me. And, and I said, Lord, you know what? I, I don't really like this truth that's in your word. I just don't. This is hard. That's a lot of money. Do you know how much I need that money more than you? And I really wrestled and struggled with God on that issue. And I felt like this. I felt like God said to me, Kim, if you don't want to tithe, that's fine. You don't have to tithe. But do me a favor and just rip Malachi chapter 3 out of your Bible and any other passage about tithing. 
And that was, wow. That was a defining moment for me. I had come full circle back to the first defining moment with Pastor Dave tearing at the pages from his Bible. So I thought and I prayed and, and I said, okay, Lord, I get it. I get it. And it, it was a very big, heavy moment for me because I realized path one got me nowhere, path two got me nowhere, path three needed to be the path I was on. So I went home and I wrote my first tithe check and I took it to church that Sunday and I put it in the collection plate and you know how I felt? I felt free. I was seeing that come to light, that freedom come to light. And here's how amazing God is. Within 48 hours after that, that Sunday when I put my, my um, tithe check in, within 48 hours, I got in the mail a letter from the IRS. Now, generally, that is not good. And I opened it kind of like this. And in it was a letter that was actually an apology letter. And it said, we, we apologize, we made a, an error in your federal refund from two years back. Two years back. When does that ever happen? And there was a check enclosed. And that check was for $12 more than the check I had just given to the church. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is how amazing God is. And it was like he was saying, Kim, it's okay. You can trust me with the tough stuff. Okay. And so path three, even though it causes us to sometimes change our thinking, to sometimes change our actions, to sometimes change our way of living or our beliefs, when we line them up with this truth, letter to letter. We are under the grace of God, under the forgiveness of God. He sets us free from all the junk, all the anxiety, all the, the confusion. He sets us free from sin. He sets us free from struggle. He sets us free from our own selves. And that's where we find freedom. We find peace. We find security. We find comfort. So in these next weeks coming up, I want to encourage you to just keep an open mind and an open heart about what God might be trying to say to you. If you're kind of in a place with some, some passages, some truths, some principles that have caused you to sort of hit that wall where you've come head to head and you need to make a decision, I want to encourage you to, to maybe take yourself back off of that path of rejection or back off of that path of ignoring and, and step foot onto the one of accepting what God said and what he has for you. And I promise you, he will show up and he can handle the tough stuff. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word will never let us down, that you drew the lines for our protection you drew the lines for our security so that we could be under your banner, so that we could find that freedom. But God, I pray for everybody here, for anyone that's finding themselves in a place of just wrestling with the passage. God, I pray in this next few weeks when we explore defining moments that you would give them their defining moment where they make the decision and take the stand to do it your way. Give them the courage. Give us all the courage to do that, God. And we know, we trust you, God, that you're going to show up and that you're going to do something extraordinary, Lord. And I thank you for that. I thank you that every word of the Bible is true, that we can rest in it and hang on it and conform to it, and we can trust you to handle all of our problems and our concerns and our struggles. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kim. Good word. That's a good word. Yeah. Real good. Wow, yeah. So, you know, I think the finding moments never end anyway. I think they continue on. They should. You should have those moments in your life where God just all of a sudden stops you in your tracks and says, where you at? 
where you at on this? And and I, I, I believe there's defining moments are sort of like those moments where something happened in our country, some tragedy, and you say, you know, do you remember where you were at, like on 9-11? Do you remember where you were at when JFK was shot, stuff like that? I think these defining moments are like that. Do you remember where you were at when God spoke to you about this? And they change you. Those moments change you. So, yeah, it's going to be a good sermon series for sure. There are, there are defining moments that God brings us to that will change your life and cause you to become more conformed into the image of God. So, um, so we're going to close with a song here, but you know, I don't think there are coincidences in the kingdom of God. I, I think timing with God is everything. And I'm convinced this sermon series timing is right on. And I believe there are a number of us here this morning that are in the middle of what I would call a defining moment. That maybe you're in the middle of a defining moment at work. You're trying to process through, what, what am I supposed to do? What is the right thing to do? Maybe some of you are in a middle of a defining moment in a relationship. What am I supposed to do? Or I know what I'm supposed to do. Will I do it? Like Kim was saying, you have certain choices there. I can reject it, the truth of God. I can ignore it or I can obey it. Maybe some of you are in the middle of a defining moment financially, making a major decision and trying to sense what God's will is, but really knowing what God's will is and trying to decide if you're going to choose plan number three. I, I believe there's some of you this morning, even in the midst of a, a ministry defining moment, and even a, a church family defining moment. You know, it, it's one thing to attend a church and say, I go to that church. But, but you, you have to agree with me. It changes when you say, this is my church. This is my family. This is my tribe. This is my family. And, and, and I just want to take a minute. I just want to pray for you this morning. Just that God would help you choose that pl pl you know, plan number three. I speaking to this morning in the midst of a defining moment just hold your hand up I just want to pray for you that God would give you the ability hold, hold your hand up hold your hand up yeah there's a number of you I see come on you know I, I'll tell you what do me a favor would you just come up front here I'm going to pray those of you that are in the middle of some kind of defining moment just come up front here we want to pray for you I want to ask that God I here's what I think I I think I think it, the only way I can say it is like this I think you know what you need to do but as Kim was saying, it ain't easy. It's not easy. Come right up front. Line up right up front here. So uh, some of our School of Kingdom Ministry, just get behind these people. And I, I want to pray. I, I, I really believe if, you know, we talk about a defining moment. But listen, this could be a defining moment where you make the wrong decision. You don't want that. You want the defining moment where you make the right decision. So... So just lift your hand up right now, those of you that are in the midst of this decision-making. Father, right now, I'm asking, Holy Spirit, I am asking that you would, you would shine your light, that they know what they're supposed to do. They know what they're supposed to do, but now I'm asking God the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, that they choose to trust you, to obey you, to do what you say. God, that, that as they move into this defining moment, it is a defining moment that launches them into that next level, that next growth experience with you, God, that they begin to experience more of your kingdom and understanding you're looking out for their good. Those in their relationship situations, those of you at work situations, ministry, church, finances, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, right now, shine your light that they see what is right. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to empower them. Just empower them, Father, in the name of Jesus. Just do me a favor. Just, just stay right up front here. Just stay in the presence of the Lord. Open your hearts. Let God speak to you. We're going we're gonna to close with this song. And uh, I just trust that the Holy Spirit is going to really, really help you in this moment in your life.
Are you hurting? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious life of Jesus. regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is coming bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is coming Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open Precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is real. As you wait for the crown 
tell the world of the treasure Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the was on this mission trip, I really felt like God spoke something to me. Uh, I found it in the book of Numbers, and it was a command God gave to the Jewish spiritual leaders. He said, when the people come together, uh, before they leave, he said, pronounce this blessing over them. He said, if you pronounce this blessing over them, I'll do it. So I, I just feel inspired, at least for the next however long, uh, on Sunday morning, I, I'd like to end our service by pronouncing a blessing over you. So. Let me say it this way. If you want it, raise your hands because I'm going to pronounce it. And you can say amen to it. All right? I'm reading right from the Word of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And God bless you. See you next week.